As I look around this room, I see a lot of people who've heard me speak on this topic before. So I should start with an apology. There'll be some repetition. I, I think uh, competence and professionalism are different qualities. And I think it's important to emphasize their difference. Competence is substantially the skillful performance of a surgical or medical service. And as Professor Snell has pointed out, that's measurable. Professionalism, on the other hand, is substantially the performance of a public duty. The duty to put the interests of patients, existing and potential, ahead of those of your own and of any other body. It has many aspects, but that is its core. It's not concerned with competence, but with conduct. And I want to emphasize here the existence within that duty of a duty to potential patients. The discussion this morning has concentrated on the duty which you as an individual have to the person sitting or lying opposite you. But the professional duty is greater than that. I've described the duty to potential patients as a collective duty. It's a duty which you, as a profession as a whole, have to ensure that you serve the whole of the Australian community, not just those who are best able to afford the skills which you undoubtedly have. Both of these qualities are important in a professional, but it's equally important, I think, to recognise the differences between them. At least in theory, you can have competence without professionalism and professionalism without competence. But here's a curious thing. In practice, those who recognise and perform their professional duty are almost always competent. But there are many competent professionals who have lost or have never had a true appreciation of their professional duty. I think it's essential to appreciate the importance of the performance of that professional duty. And it's also equally important to emphasise the importance of the public perception of that performance. That is because the public and the government perception will determine your future. It will determine who decides your competence and who decides your professionalism. I've said many times in the past, and this is the repetition I'm afraid, that true professions like medicine and the law have, or more accurately, once had two privileges conferred on them. The first was a right to professional autonomy, the right to control its own affairs and its members, and the second was an exclusive right to practice in a defined area of work. The reason why those privileges were conferred, and this is very important, is that it was accepted both by the public and the government that the members of those professions had and performed the public duty to which I've just referred. I've discussed elsewhere how, in your profession, those two privileges have eroded over time, largely through government action. I don't want to go there now. But the reason why those privileges have eroded in both the public and the government uh, is that the public and the government have become more sceptical about the performance by you of that public duty. You, as a profession, were once held in the highest esteem both by the public and the government. And individual patients no doubt still have the highest regard for those medical practitioners who treated them. But you should not mistake that for public esteem. A couple of years ago, a British surgeon, Mr Thomas Dean, who spoke at the uh, ASC of the College of Surgeons here, said that in the United Kingdom, and I'm quoting him, the government and probably also the public view of surgeons is that they are greedy, obstructive to change, 
have standards below par, are unable or unwilling to self-regulate, and that they are doctor-centric, not patient-centric. Now, I'm far from saying that view is correct. I don't think it is. And uh, Mr Dean, to be fair to him, wasn't saying that that view was correct. What he was saying was that that was the government view, and he thought possibly also the public view uh, in the UK. And I would not be surprised if that were very close to the public view and certainly the government view here. The recent uniform legislation of which you're all aware, with its equation of your profession with those occupations of podiatry, osteopathy, acupuncture and chiropractic, and its substantially greater government control over your profession, is some support for the contention that that is indeed the government view of you here. That's extremely important, as I've attempted to explain in the past, because unless that view changes, your profession will come under increasingly government control, both with respect to standards of competence and with respect to standards of competence. How did you come to that point, and what can you do about it now? Well, I know these are questions which the College of Surgeons uh, is presently addressing. And they are, I believe, two of the most important questions for your profession for its future. It's not sufficient that you believe that you're training competent professionals. It's not sufficient that you believe you're ensuring that they maintain that competence. You must be able to demonstrate that publicly. In other words, your systems for achieving these things must be transparent and they must be convincing. Let me attempt to explain why that's so, <coughs> pardon me, by giving you an analogy. <clears throat> when Socrates was explaining his ideal city-state to Plato, he posed a guardian class who would ensure the integrity of society and protect it against corruption. Plato then asked, but who will guard the guardians? To which Socrates responded, that they, having accepted such a noble undertaking, could be relied on to police themselves. There was a time long ago when our forefathers may well have thought that about their political leaders, but no one believes that anymore. And the reason for that is that we've become better educated, better informed, more sophisticated and more sceptical. The same is true, I believe, about the public and government view of you as a profession. To some extent, I think that like politicians, you've brought it on yourselves, or I should say more accurately, at least some of you have brought it on the rest. Whether or not you agree with that, and I suspect a lot of you don't, I think you must agree that however important it is to ensure that you train competent professions, professionals and make sure that they remain competent, it's equally important that you publicly demonstrate that you're doing this. Unless you do, I think you will become a mere service industry, under government control in respect of all aspects of your competence and your conduct. Thank you for listening to me.